to the Take the North podcast. I'm David Hoff on the Mully and Haw Show. Dan Weeder is from the Chicago Tribune covering the Bears. And we appreciate you listening to the Take the North podcast on your free Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can watch us on 670 Scores YouTube page. Well, the Bears have an offensive coordinator, Dan. The announcement has not yet been made, but the news has been reported. Shane Waldron, former Seahawks offensive coordinator and play caller, the new Bears OC. What do you think? Yeah, as we record this, Bears are trying to finalize that contract and get it uh, across the finish line. Obviously, this is the end of a search that saw them reach out to nine offensive coordinator candidates. I had a 10th in Kellen Moore, whose interview uh, was not allowed by the team that currently employs him, the Chargers. Uh, And so now you have uh, a a new offensive overseer at Hallis Hall, and it's a guy in Shane Waldron who's got uh, previous play calling experience, which I think was one of the more attractive things of his candidacy, three years in Seattle, uh, working first with Russell Wilson and then pivoting into the two seasons with with Geno Smith. He's got experience working under Bill Belichick, Sean McVay, Pete Carroll. Um, energetic, on the rise coach, according to, to, to people within league circles, a good teacher. But David, I said uh, a couple times on Monday that you get a lot of praise for guys in the hiring process, right? When someone's hired, there's a lot of hopeful optimistic visions about what they can be in their new setting. It's a wait and see to see how he will marry up with whoever the bears choose at quarterback and how that will ultimately uh, lead to results. But uh, out of the gates, you, you've got a guy that, that comes highly recommended. I think your words are wise. And if you look back at probably every offensive coordinator, the bears have gone through over the last six to 10 years, a lot of the same things were said when they were yeah. identified as the guy. You know, the yeah. energy, the communication skills, the innovation, the history, the pedigree, all the things. I, I will say this, you know, Shane Waldron has has people in his past that not are only just considered really good football guys, but some of the best of the best. Bill Belichick worked for him. Sean McVay worked for him. Pete Carroll worked for him. Came into the coaching profession as a as a graduate assistant at Notre Dame under Charlie Weiss, who at the time was really highly thought of in the industry. And, you know, you're the head coach at Notre Dame. So you, you know, I, I kidded on, on the Mullen and Haas show about that. Those were the days when Charlie Weiss did have a schematic decided schematic advantage over his uh, peers. And Shane Waldron was in on that from the ground floor. So I do think that in this case, sometimes when you, are numbed by the platitudes or by the things that sound the same. You're more impressed by the pedigree or the background. And Shane Waldron does have an impressive background. Well, there's some flexibility here. And I mentioned the pivot from Russell Wilson to Geno Smith and obviously unlocking Geno Smith to a level where he had a career year in 2022. Went to the Pro Bowl, was named the NFL's Comeback Player of the Year uh, for the the success that he had within that season. Well, even within this past season, when Geno Smith uh, was out, for a couple of weeks, you had to pivot on the fly uh, to Drew Locke. And in one of those games, it was um, right before we got on here, I finished watching the final drive of probably the only person in America today to watch the final drive of Seahawks Eagles from week 15. But that's a game where, where the Seahawks spent all week preparing two quarterbacks to play. Didn't know if Geno Smith was going to be ready. He ultimately wasn't ready. Drew Locke played, and they didn't have a great offensive game, but in a game online moment, backed up inside their own 10 with under two minutes to go, they went and and put together a 92-yard game-winning touchdown drive that kept their playoff hopes alive at that time. And so um, you watch that, and then he comes back six days later when they go back to Geno Smith, and they have another uh, game-winning drive, uh, touchdown drive in the final minute to beat the Tennessee Titans, you see some things where you go, okay, like there's, there's, there's some, some nice things to watch here and and dissect and analyze and try to figure out how they'll translate going forward. Um, It's not just the quarterbacks either. Kenneth Walker, the last couple of years has had a pretty good run and that's kind of uh, true to Shane Waldron's uh, strive to create balance in his offense as well. And that's gotta be a mandate for Matt Eberflus. The fact that if you are the head coach and you're a defensive minded head coach, as they say, you want to have the complimentary football, which is always the goal. You don't want to have bring in somebody that's going to, you know, abandon the running game or that's going to be your biggest concern. I think that was the kind of the runaway fear people started expressing about Cliff Kingsbury. I don't think it was founded. And I do wonder what uh, the purpose of that interview was now that all is said and done. I wonder if it was as much of a vetting process to find out information about Caleb Williams as much as it was to consider him as a play caller, but it doesn't, it's a kind of a moot point at this, at this stage. 
but I do think Shane Waldron brings you some balance and brings you, you know, some experience with developing Kenneth Walker, with developing uh, Drew Locke quickly, and also um, reviving Geno Smith's career. He, he, he was, you know, again, you don't know about these reports. He came to Seattle as the hand pick, hand picked offensive coordinator from Russell Wilson. And so it tells you that he has a lot of respect in the league. And I think the bears probably feel like they have upgraded at that spot. And I think they needed to, Dan, I do wonder this, what you think. Um, there are two things that you wonder when this is made, made, uh, known number one, what say will he have in the decision at quarterback? And secondly, if it's just coincidence or, I'm wondering if you think that because they have the same agent, if this was something that uh, accelerated the process or had anything to do with making him a more desired candidate in the eyes of the Bears. Yeah, I can't say one way or the other on that one. It's obviously Matt and Ryan share the same agent, which is now the same agent that that uh, Shane Aldrin has. I believe Luke Getze is a, a client of Trace Armstrong's as well. This is not as uncommon in the league as um, people might think. It, it is notable for certain because it is, you know, part of a, a tree or a family, as you will. And and the Bears obviously reached out, as we mentioned a, a few minutes ago, to a, a handful of candidates, had nine interviews known and an attempt that got shut down. So I, I don't really know what to make of it. Um, going forward to your first question, which is, I think is, is incredibly significant is it's really going to be intriguing to see what level of input Shane Waldron has uh, in the, the quarterback process, because you're going to want to have things married up. You know, you're going to want to have a coordinator's vision married up with the quarterback you select. You're going to want to have an understanding of what works and what doesn't. And so I would have to imagine that while Ryan Poles will be the ultimate decision maker there, that that the, the process of soliciting feedback, having these people alongside him over the next three months to go on these trips, to have, be next to him when, when prospects come into Hallis Hall to vet these prospects, that you would want a high level of input from the person that's going to be calling the plays and running the offense for said quarterback. And so that's going to be really interesting to see. I'm not sure yet when the first time we'll hear from Shane Waldron, uh, in the media will be, but there's going to be a lot of pretty pointed questions that need to be asked right out of the gates just to get a, a greater feel for his attraction to this job, the Bears' attraction to him, and where it goes from here. The only reason I ask the aging question is I, I do agree with you. It, people would be surprised at how many um, guys are, are similar that th these agents represent. It's not a big group of people, but when you have a, a relationship, it, it, I, I think the implications sometimes can be almost like sinister or underhanded. It makes people suspicious. But I also wonder if it could be uh, help kind of bridge the gap with things like, OK, I know this guy is going to be more accepting of, of having the offensive line coach and the tight ends coach already there. He's not going to be resistant. He would be somebody worth calling because this app would not be a deal breaker, whereas for some people it might be. So Chris Morgan being here. Um, Jim, Dre. Jim Dre being here, that, that won't be as much of an impediment, obviously, because if it was, he wouldn't have taken the job. And maybe they know this kind of intel before they pursue it based on the fact that they share an agent. So it can be work. It can, it can work to your advantage as much as it can be used or held against you because you know, the implication being that you're just having this one agent, you know, kind of pick guys in as pawns and put them where he wants to on, on, a, on a kind of a, a game board. Right. Well, now there's three more significant hires that need to be made on that side of the ball with a quarterback's coach who's going to be instrumental in developing whatever quarterback is chosen to be the the, the starter in 2024 and beyond. Uh, you're going to need a new receivers coach. You're going to need a new running backs coach. And so that process has to uh, get going in a way that will make um, Shane Waldron both comfortable and competent as he goes forward in, in his new role here in Chicago. I think when you, you kind of see some of the the things that have been written and said and um some of the track records of Shane Waldron you're going to you're going to hear some of those things that that tell you why he would have connected with Matt Eberflus so, so readily his his desire to play complimentary football his desire to establish the run his desire to eliminate turnovers first and foremost above anything else and then when opportunities present themselves to seize um big play opportunities you go ahead and do that Seattle, he had an opportunity with a, a receiving core loaded with big play weapons to, you know, turn loose DK Metcalf, to turn loose Tyler Lockett this last year to get Jackson Smith and Jigba going a little bit. Um, so you're going to hear some familiar rhetoric when Shane War Waldron takes over. Uh, the other one that, that comes in there um, is his desire for 
player input in game, which is something that was said to me on, on Monday morning. And that is one of the reasons that I believe for all three seasons, but it, it, at least this last year, he called the plays from the sideline because he likes feeling that and not having to communicate from up in a box over a headset and trying to get intel on what's happening on the field that can help him make some of those uh, all important in-game uh, tweaks to what you're doing. This is a general comment, probably not terribly fair and certainly speculative. But I wonder if the fact that he is – all these guys have to be pretty well-versed or experienced in dealing with what I would refer to as high-maintenance personalities. So, you know, Russell Wilson in his last year at Seattle, my sense is that based on what we heard about the reporting of that and then the transition to Denver and all those things, was probably a little bit of a high-maintenance guy. So you, <laughs> you, would have to, you would have to have a play caller or an offensive coordinator that is somewhat tolerant – of high maintenance players because they may maybe believe, well, you know what, put him in the best position to succeed. We'll put up with the idiosyncrasies and still get the most out of him. I don't know if that happened or not in Seattle, but I think that you have the, my perception is you had a willingness on Shade Waldron's part to, to play the game and to try to get the most out of his quarterback. Why is that relevant in Chicago? Well, it could be very relevant if you go ahead and you draft Caleb Williams and there are questions to be answered about his readiness for an NFL franchise quarterback role, uh, his maturity, the human being, the character issues that have come under scrutiny, certainly. And I do think you have somebody in Shane Waldron that has, has at least dealt with high maintenance personalities and done so rather, you know, at least he has the experience in doing that. Yeah, I mean, I laugh out loud. Well, two reasons I laugh out loud. Number one, I'm going to need studs to pull up our pilot episode of Take the North, where I know we laid out a mission statement of what we were going to be. And I was checking my bullet points. I couldn't find them here in my office, but probably not fair and certainly speculative, I don't think was on our original mission statement. So just kidding on that one, David. Okay. But, but the, the that, other that's, part fair. Of this, that's fair. That's yeah. fair. My, my, my second laugh was <laughs> thinking back to Mark Tressman, and, and you talk about having to deal with, some high maintenance personalities and trying to figure that out. It didn't go so well, right? Like that, that, that got off the rails quickly when the Brandon Marshalls and Martellus Bennett's of the world, you know, needed more out of, <laughs> out of the head coach and offensive mastermind than they were able to get. And, and Jay Cutler and anybody else that you might want to consider in that offense as, as having a little bit of a personality that requires yeah. some, some molding. So this is a job that requires communication skills. It is a, a job that requires, you know, relationship skills because this is a roller coaster that's not easy to ride at all times. And to your point with a um, young rookie, pro probably possibly coming on board here in the next few months, you, you, you got to have somebody that provides that steadiness. I actually thought that that was one of the strongest um, parts of the union between Justin Fields and Luke Getze was that, that, that they collectively were good for one another and steadying, a pretty rocky ride, you know, and, and riding that roller coaster with some some grace and equilibrium that that isn't common. And so hopefully uh, Shane Waldron can find the same sort of setup with whatever quarterback he's overseeing. This is me backpedaling into another conversation or topic. So well put. Uh, speaking of Mark Tressman, his oh. first season, Chris Harris was a defensive quality control coach. His mentor or boss was John Hope, the secondary coach at the time. That's relevant now because Chris Harris uh, reportedly either will interview or has interviewed for the defensive coordinator position with the Bears. Much different role than it is on most staffs. We've established that. But Chris Harris is a former Bears safety. He started for them in the Super Bowl. He understands the cover two concept that Matt Eberflus believes in. And to me, this would be a great fit. And I would be thrilled if Chris Harris were to rejoin the Bears organization, covered him as a player, remember him as a rookie. I uh, remember the day he was traded and uh, remember him as an assistant coach. And all of the memories are good ones because this is a consummate pro, smart football guy, and somebody who understands how to communicate with players. Yeah, I was here. I was trying to remember earlier today um, whether he was here for both Trestman seasons or just the first. Um, and obviously you bring up the union between him and John Hoke, which I know that was uh, something that, that – 
you know, is certainly notable in this instance. It'll be interesting to see how quickly the Bears move on the defensive front as they get the offensive side of things settled with their coaching staff. There hasn't been as much activity and or chatter on that side over the last week and a half, as you might expect. Um, but maybe they know what they're after on that side and, and, and can get there quickly. And to your point, Matt Eberflus is still going to be the guy with his fingerprints all over that defense and potentially still the guy calling the plays. But this gives you an opportunity to potentially – um, develop a younger coach beneath you and, and and see what direction it goes with some familiarity, both with some guys on the staff as well as just the, the program at Hallis Hall. Hearing any other names, does Sean Desai make any sense to even call to see if he'd be interested in returning to the organization where he got started and he was in Seattle and then he got fired in Philadelphia and certainly he's somebody who is respected. I just wondered, could he be somebody, anybody else come to mind? Well, you, you know, Sean – really was a disciple of Vic Fangio and a little bit of right. a different defensive style there. So I'm not sure that would necessarily mold e e uh, very easily with, with what Matt is running in his regards. And then just kind of waiting to, I don't have a whole lot of other names to throw at you right now and waiting for some more activity on that front to figure out which way the bears might, might lean. I think that with uh, that role, you need somebody, what's the biggest job, is, what's the biggest quality in, in that, or the most important part of the job description is, can follow uh, can follow direction and doesn't have too big of an ego, right? I mean, he doesn't need uh, to be the guy calling the calling the shots on third and long, and is able to understand uh, the power structure. And I I just think that uh, you're either going to get somebody who hasn't done it before, like maybe Chris Harris, or somebody who is at the stage of his career where it doesn't matter that it's just a, a you know a, a, a title in name only and not worried about the power structure necessarily. And I think either one of those situations, if you get that guy, then that would be a good hire. Yeah. Well, and there's an attractiveness to this job also because you're inheriting a group that's on the rise, you know, and, and that has um, established playmakers and some young up and comers within it. So um, whoever comes in is going to have an opportunity really quickly to, do a lot of what you want to do because you can trust that the guys on the field to, to handle what you're trying to do. So that's going to be interesting to see which direction that goes. Keeping with the Bears coaching staff, did I see correctly, is Richard Hightower coaching in one of these all-star games? I believe he is, is he? the head coach of one of the uh, teams for the East-West Shrine game, um, which I think is a, a Thursday night game. I think it might be a, a primetime uh, college all-star game that might come up this week before – before championship week. And then obviously the senior bowl rolls in uh, the following week in mobile. Uh, but you are correct. Yeah. Richard Hightower will get some experience there. I think uh, we might need someone to double check this, but I think Dave Borgonzi is, is uh, doing something within that realm as well. Yes. Dave Borgonzi, I believe has uh, an uh, all-star game assignment as well. So the bear staff is busy. I thought he might be a candidate for the defensive coordinator role, but uh, maybe he still is. Maybe Chris Harris is just getting an interview and will join the staff, but he's, uh, formerly of the Tennessee Titans staff, and that staff, of course, cut loose with the Mike Vrabel firing. All right, Dan, anything else about the staff before I ask you a couple questions and takeaways about the playoff weekend? No, the playoff weekend was fascinating <laughs> on a lot of levels. Those were four um, entertaining football games in, in different ways, and so I'm happy to pivot and go in that direction because that was, that was a cool weekend of playoff football. Looks like it's fun, David, to, to, to be a part of playoff yeah, what would that, what would that be like? I mean, Patrick Mahomes has 13 playoff victories, and it's been 13 years since the Bears have had their last one. Um, when you look at the Lions, and it was three years ago uh, today that we were making fun of Dan Campbell because three years ago on Sunday was his introductory press conference where he's talking about biting kneecaps and setting a tone and establishing a culture. But that's exactly what he did. He established a culture, and when you see what he did, you understand what coaches are talking about. This is who the Lions were always supposed to be under Dan Campbell. And sort of the power of his passion is the reason why they have a chance to play in the Super Bowl this year. So I ask you this. When you see what they have done, they won 12 games in his first two seasons. They were 12-5 and five this season. And I just wonder, you want to see, do you look at that as, okay, there's the example of what the Bears can point to next year as a realistic goal uh, and you want to set your standards high, or do you look at it as like, boy, this NFC North is become the, becoming the toughest division in football, and there's no way the Bears are even close 
to competing with the Lions and then look at the Packers. So, whoa, I hate watching this. Which is it? Probably somewhere in the middle. I, you know, I think it's really easy to be a prisoner of the moment and seeing teams get hot at the right times. I'm, I still have some, you know, the, the, the Green Bay Packers got better and they were very good in stretches down the, the, the stretch of the season. Uh, Jordan Love had a, a really, really good season, much better than I expected. Um, but I just need to see some of that sustained before I believe that the Packers are still going to be in every year. Um, playoff team. I just, I need to see more. And that's, that's fine. If, if others want to go there first, the lions give you a lot to model yourself after um, it's going to be different because you used a good phrase there, the power of passion with Dan Campbell, because that is the fuel and a few weeks hiring a, a new coach. And, and with that, David, it was the, the thought process to it was, Whoever it is, this was under the assumption of Matt Eberflus were to get fired, which direction would you lean? Well, every coach in this league has a, a reported superpower. And the advice of this person was, if you have one of those people, when you sit down in a room with a coaching candidate, you better be able to walk out of that room just completely hypnotized by their superpower. With a Mike McDaniel, for example, the guy has got a reputation around the league as being one of the most brilliant minds in the sport. So if you sit down with Mike McDaniel and talk to him for a while, you better walk out of that room being like, whoa, I just thought about 15 things that I never thought about in the sport of football because this guy's intellect and football wisdom just came across. Well, with Dan Campbell, it's it's the power of passion. It's that it's that belief and buy-in and fueled energy that he created on day one with that introductory press conference that you mentioned. And, and, and it left people in Detroit feeling like, okay, you know, there's something here. And as much as he got lampooned in the early going for being kind of meatheady and, and caricatured of, of, of the football guy, everyone in that building fed off that passion. And it's been fuel for two and a half years that's now led them to the, the, the doorstep of the Super Bowl with a, uh, obviously a very challenging game in San Francisco uh, on championship weekend. Um, but that you, you're not going to replicate that with Matt Eberflus, right? Like, like, like Dan Campbell did something in Detroit that, Matt Eberflus is not going to be able to do with his passion, but whatever Matt does at the highest level, he has found a way to get this football team to improve. He's got this football team to bond together. And Matt's own words are, are kind of, it's that, that, that buy-in process of creating glue within a team. So when times get rough, it doesn't splinter. And so if you can build on that and then take the talent and the playmaking ability that you need to go from the middle tier to the upper tier, maybe you can climb that staircase next year. What is that superpower for Matt Eberflus? What is his I, I, biggest selling point? It's, I mean, it's a great question, but I think it's what I just mentioned. I think what he prides himself on is 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 creating that that unbreakable bond within a team, you know. And so when you do start a season zero and four, and you do have uh, major turbulence, and you have blown leads and blowout losses, and coaches who leave the building, and every reason for things to cave in. You've heard Ryan Poles mention it on numerous occasions that 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 Matt has stayed steady and kept it all. Uh, the boat hasn't capsized, you know, and and so maybe that is it. Maybe that's that's the superpower that that he is going to have to lean into uh, and bring out to the highest level to get things going. Um, this league's crazy. I mean, you know, there's no reason that the Bears can't dream of playing in the playoffs next year. There's no reason they can't dream of winning a playoff game next year, but still a lot of things have to go right. Um, and to your point now, the Lions are in your way in a division that seemed like it was going to open up when Aaron Rodgers left. And now all of a sudden it's like, whoa, there's more obstacles on this out course than we thought. So the other question I had pertains to the AFC. And when you watch the Ravens, I talked about this going into the playoffs and I'm sure we're going to be talking about this coming out because it doesn't look like the Ravens have any business or planning to lose at home, even as those to the Chiefs. That'll be a good game to watch. They might. But Lamar Jackson, 150 uh, plus passing yards, 100 yards rushing, two touchdowns running, two touchdowns passing. In the ideal world, and you maximize the potential of a Justin Fields, stylistically, he's similar to Lamar Jackson. Are there differences? Of course there are differences. Lamar Jackson has an MVP. He's got a head coach that's been there forever. He's got an infrastructure and an offensive line and all the things that maybe Justin Fields lacks in terms of a team around him. But I wonder, the more success the Ravens have in the postseason, like they did on Saturday with Lamar Jackson leading the way, how much does that reinforce the argument or change or affect the debate 
in Chicago for those who believe as much as they do in Justin Fields. Yeah, I I, I don't even find this as a startable argument because the level of accomplishment is just a, it's just it's two different tiers of quarterbacks here. Like Lamar Jackson has accomplished, you know, he's through seven or eight checkpoints that that Justin hasn't even reached yet, and so. I struggle with it. I understand the stylistic comparison here, um, but it's just really easy to 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 think these two players are well, are, are how are many similar times and identical. How many times have we watched the Bears in 2023 and 2022, and somebody come out of it after an escape, a third and long, a gain of 22 or a gain of 11, and say, you know, there's only one other quarterback in the NFL who can do what Justin Fields just did. I agree, but 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 so so the flashes are similar. The week in, week out, game in, game out production isn't similar. And you can go through any metric and look at it and go, oh, it, it may it may seem like it's a uh, 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 apt comparison, but when you look at a huge body of work, it's just not. I, I it wouldn't it wouldn't sell me on like, oh, you know, Lamar's going to the Super Bowl, so that that's the reason we need to stay with Justin. If if you want to stay with Justin, you have to convince yourself that Justin can be a high-level quarterback in this league, and through three seasons, he hasn't been. He's had flashes that show great potential. He's had flashes that show um, talent and and explosive playability that is truly breathtaking, but it, it's none of it's been consistent. The field's been missing. Some of the, you know, I, we can do this on another episode because I put forth, and we may have gone over this in a podcast in, in September, you know, a dozen goals for Justin Fields in the 2023 season that would have been signs of major progress. And I, I updated them this week um, to see where he finished. And there's a lot of them they didn't reach. And, and, and they're not, again, they weren't the pie in the sky goals. And so I don't know. I, I, I'm just not there yet, particularly if you want to go to the other team in the AFC and you, you think that the, the true goal here is to get yourself a guy like Patrick Mahomes, who even in a down year wins a division championship and pushes you in to, to the championship game every single year. Like that's the dream. I'm I'm team. I'm, I haven't changed my stance. I still think they've got to go after the, the Patrick Mahomes clone. The one thing closest to him and Caleb Williams, but mark this pod. If, and these are big ifs, you have to qualify. If the bears somehow convince themselves or find something about Caleb Williams that, that compels yeah. them to stick with Justin Fields and the Ravens get to the Super Bowl. I guarantee the first time we asked the Bears at a press conference, why did you do that? What do you see in Justin Fields? What does the ceiling look like? They're going to reference what Lamar Jackson did with the Ravens and how you can win with that style of quarterback. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I don't know why this is such a big leap for people to make. I mean, it's because it's because, it's because the two quarterbacks, they're not, they're not they're not comparable. They're just not, they're not comparable at this point. And it, you like, I, I saw something, this is a, a bit of a tangent, but there was a something on Twitter today. Patrick Mahomes is playoff record now is 13 and three. Okay. So that that's under the old traditional 16 game format. That's a, a full season. He's 13 and three in the postseason. And somebody had tweeted out his 16 game postseason statistics comped up against the 16 game statistics for the last non Patrick Mahomes MVP quarterbacks in the league. And they were essentially the same statistics. And it was like playoff Mahomes is a regular season MVP in the league, which is crazy to think about. You're playing only good teams. You're playing high stakes, high pressure games. Um, I, that's a little bit of a tangent from what you were talking about, but it's partially related because it's just, you know, like that, that's, that's where the Caleb Williams attraction becomes, so intoxicating, right? right? Because you're like, oh my God, like we don't even need everything to go right because the belief factor that that guy creates by being an all world playmaker, it just takes you deep into January every single year. And the whole goal of all of this is to be able to have sustainable success for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. And, and the chiefs obviously have, have, have found that with, with Patrick in, in a major way. And I think for those Caleb William fans out there, you should go to the 670 the scores Odyssey app. Um, your free Odyssey app and get 670 scores rewind button Friday, last Friday. That would have been January 19th. I believe uh, the interview with Caleb Williams, high school football coach from Washington, DC coach Trivers. I think it was really enlightening. Well done by the Parkers and Spiegel show. So that would be worth your time because the bears are trying to figure out who this kid is, who this young man is, what makes him tick. 
And I think that things like that help you understand a little bit more about what they're looking for and what you might be dealing with. So, okay, no more comparisons. I'm not going to do the whole maybe Justin Fields and Brock Purdy. Maybe you see that. I don't know. Well, listen, I mean, it's it's fair that you bring it up because it's going to get brought up. I, I, I just like there are just differences in the consistency with which they play the position. Um, and that, that's where I get hung up. You know, it's, it's again, like I, that argument that mushroomed up in Chicago in November and December that uh, all good quarterbacks struggle. So all struggling quarterbacks must have the potential to be good. It lost me. You know, it, it's one of those things where it's like, OK, like, you know, there's a lot of these comparative games that that, that leave people pretzeled to trying to um, get themselves to confirm what they already believe. How many teams over the weekend could have uh... – uh, or wish that they had your guy Cairo Santos kicking for them. I know that probably brought a smile to your face. Tyler Bass, wide right. And then no. Packers rookie, he didn't have it. And then there was a, a doink by, was that in the, uh, oh, the Buccaneers kicker. So all kinds of things happen. Kickers matter. I know they they uh, get overlooked, and I'm the first one to kind of maybe chastise them. But you saw over the weekend why. Do you have time for a quick story on this? Because it's, sure. it, 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 I peek behind the curtain of my personal life on Sunday. So my, my son's 11th birthday parties, plural, kids party in the morning, uh, family party in the afternoon was on Sunday. The, 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 everyone had departed for the fourth quarter of the Chiefs-Bills game. So we were just left there. And for whatever reason, this kid who has owned a Patrick Mahomes jersey for three years is out on Patrick Mahomes. He's tired of the Chiefs winning and he was rooting heavily for the Buffalo Bills. And I was like, this is so bizarre. I was trying to understand the psychology all afternoon and how he turned on Patrick Mahomes just because he wins too much. And and so we're sitting there, and the Bills are going down in position, it seems, to be able to tie the game there on that last stretch. And then Tyler Bass comes out. And that kick, David, I, I still haven't read the description of what went wrong on that kick, but that thing was – it was like one of my tee shots. It was just a banana ball, left to right, way right of the upright. His jaw, my son's jaw hit the hit the the couch at, when that kick missed. My stomach dropped because it just like it left me in this this feeling of like the Buffalo Bills have been on kind of a dream turnaround for the last five years, and here they are facing the, the mountain, and they can't get over this last little hurdle, of this mountain, and you're just like, oh my god, that kick just sunk an entire city we lived this right i mean we we, we we freaking live this and i don't know if it was ptsd but i had like in a game i really wasn't emotional about i got really emotional watching that kick sail wide right because i was just like oh my god like those poor people in buffalo like like whatever my cody parky flashbacks whatever my 11 year old son is feeling as a peripheral bills fan like that is exponentially times 3,000 of what the people in uh, Buffalo are feeling. And you're just like, you know how hard it is to get to that stage of the playoffs every year. And then to have something like that go astray, like, Oh my God. Like I like, talking about it. I'm getting upset again because it's just like, Holy crap, poor Buffalo, poor Tyler Bass, poor bills, but such as sports, such as the NFL. And that kid's been a pretty good kicker for the last few years. He has been, but not last night when it mattered and somewhere in Buffalo on Twitter, Scott Norwood was trending. Oh God. I mean, it's, it's like, Oh, Oh, it's just like, I can't imagine the torture except I can because we have in various forms with Doink. Cody Parkey with the Cubs, with every other thing that oh, now the Cubs got to bring the Cubs into it. <laughs> All right. We will keep you back. If there's news this week, we'll talk about it. We'll keep people updated. Keep checking out our Twitter feed at take the North pod and at Dan Weeder and then at David Haw. For Adam Sadzinski and Dan Weeder, I'm David Haw. Thank you for listening to the Take the North podcast. Great talk. See you out there.